Hey, what's going on? It's Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com here, and this is episode number 46 of Goulet Q&A, my little question and answer session where you get to ask me whatever you want, and I will answer it. Okay, not everybody's, but I got a good number of questions, and uh, this, this week's one is a little weird. Normally, I shoot the Q&A the day before it posts, because that's how much time it takes for post-processing and publishing, exporting, blah, 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 all that stuff. Well, this one, I'm actually out of town this week, so I am shooting this on August 21st, and I'm publishing it today on August 29th. So I have to predict eight days into the future everything that's going to happen so that I can talk about it for my intro into the Q&A. So let me go ahead and just really like channel my thoughts a week and a day into the future. So it's it's Labor Day weekend. That's pretty cool. So for those of us here in the US, we're gonna get a three day weekend this weekend. So that's pretty exciting. I don't know if you guys got anything cool going on. Um, Rachel and I don't really have any big plans. We are we are traveling, so that should be, I guess that's kind of big plans, but uh, you know, not, not too big a deal, you know, no thing. Um, you know, I can't believe how crazy all that stuff is on Twitter right now. It's just like stuff's blowing up and can't believe how viral, you know, that stuff has gotten. It's just crazy, you know, really. I can't, it's just so much to talk about. Like I can't even give you specifics. And yeah, I was like watching the news and there's all these events and it's just like, you know, can't we just figure this out already? Like, come on, really? We're still talking about this? But, uh, you know, my kids are doing great. You know, they're, they're learning and growing every day and they're really adorable, but kind of frustrating. So, you know, that's how kids are at this age. And Goulet team is solid here. Everybody's doing great, holding things down. So it's been, been a really good last week since the last Q&A, even though I just shot it like three hours ago, but that's okay. <laughs> ah, I'm just being dumb. Okay, so I got some questions for the q and I actually ended up getting so many that um, I was able to do last week's Q&A and this week's together with the same bank of questions. So, and they were all pretty solid too. So um, I'll go ahead and kick it off here with a question from Jacob W on Facebook, who said, I know you can increase the flow of an ink by widening the channel on the ink feed, but is there a way to reduce ink flow in a feed? <clears throat> Well, not necessarily in the feed itself. So the feed is gonna kinda do what it does. Basically, when you're looking at a feed, there's like one thing that you can do, okay? So I've got a pen here. This is a uh, Edison Nouveau Premier. Um, so if you, I'm gonna pull the feed out of the pen. So if you look on most feeds, we'll have this series of fins that's on here, right? And these fins help to regulate the air that's going in and the ink that's going out. Well, Technically, if you are blocking some of the fins on this feed, you can inhibit the air movement, which will decrease the ink flow. That's one thing you can do. Depending on the type of pen, depending on how easy it is to access the feed, will determine how easy it is to do that. Usually a little silicone grease will do that, will help to kind of block up those channels. Um, you don't want to get it actually in the ink channel on the top, but it will, if you do it on the fins on the bottom, it can, regulate that flow a little bit, but I gotta tell you, it's really imprecise and it's really tough to get that done right um, because you just, it's, it requires a lot of experimentation. It's not like a super exact science. It's gonna depend on the ink, it's gonna depend on a lot of different things, but theoretically, that's how you do it. Now, usually, yeah, okay, so you talked about, yeah, the, the feed. Um, there are some things you can do with the nib um, if you want to, um, you know, if the, if the nib is writing too wet, which that could help balance out the flow of the feed, um, if you hold the pen like this, you can actually push your fingers down, um, your fingernails down and kind of bend the tines a little bit. Um, not too aggressively, because you don't want to break your feed or do anything crazy, but if you just bend them down a little bit so they, they get closer together, that will decrease the capillary action on your nib tines and can help to decrease your flow as well. That's another way to do it. Or you can use a drier ink. Depending on how wet the ink you're using will determine which ink is drier or not. The driest inks that I know of are the Pelican, the normal line, 4001 line, but there's not a huge color selection there. So you got a couple of different options. You can give that a shot. Um, Derek S on Facebook, hello, Brian. I have a Noodler's Conrad pen and acrylic Marianas Blue. 
For some reason, I don't feel the nib is as flexy as some say that it is. Do noodlers, do, does noodlers make normal nail nibs, or are they all semi-flex? Also, do you know if the new music flex nib of the Neponset will be available to purchase separately? Thank you for all the hard work in the videos. Well, you're welcome, Derek. Um, yes, Noodlers does make a non-flex nib. However, they don't put the non-flex nib on any of their pens. I'd be really surprised if that's the situation that you're in. Now, the one kind of exception going on right now is that um, Noodlers is doing a thousand clear Ahabs where they're including the regular non-flex nib in with the box with the pen of the clear Ahab with the flex nib. Now that nib wouldn't be installed on the pen already. You would have had to do that yourself. So, and you said you bought a Conrad and Mariana's blue anyway. So unless something crazy and whatever happened, you should not have a non-flex nib on your pen. It should be flexible. And the way that you can tell, the non-flex nibs look like your standard nib. It's got a slit down the tine with a little hole at the end of that slit. The, the regular flex noodler's nib, the slit goes all the way down to the grip of the pen and there's no hole. So that's how you can tell just at a glance between the two of those, whether you have a flex nib or not. Now, depending on how you hold the pen, can greatly determine, oh, actually I've got an Ahab right here. Let me see. Depending on how you're holding the pen will determine how flexible you feel that it is. If you're holding your pen really upright, yeah, it's not gonna flex very easily. You gotta make sure that your pen angle is down really low. I don't know what you're dealing with here, Derek, but try lowering your pen angle and then flexing it out a little bit. That might be part of it. And also the flex is really only gonna happen on the downstroke. If you're trying to do it on the cross stroke or upstroke or whatever, it's not gonna feel very flexible, only on the downstroke. So those are a couple of things for you to try, um, but I, I don't know that I would go first to saying that it's a nib issue unless you have something like what I described. Um, and you also asked about if the music flex nibs on the Neponset will be available separately. I highly doubt it. Um, Noodlers just now started offering the regular Conrad Ahab flex nib apart from the pen, and it took what, three years for Nathan to finally make that available? And even then, the quantities have not been bountiful. Um, this, I know for a fact, he's been in development of this Neponset music nib for at least three and a half years. That's when I first found out about it. And I think he's had something like 50 or 60 prototypes of this nib. So I seriously doubt he's ever going to offer it apart from the pen. So, but then again, I can't speak for Nathan. That's just my speculation. Scott R. on Facebook, can you recommend a good starter vintage fountain pen to look for? Any tips for vintage newbies? Also, is there a vintage pen you'd bring back into production if you could? That's a good question. I've never been asked that before. Um, well, for those of you who watch regularly know, I'm not like really big into vintage. I've got a couple of vintage pens. I've got an Estabrook and I've got a, you know, a Parker 21, a Parker 51, a Schaefer Targa. I've got Waterman 52. I've got a maybe Todd Swan. So I've, I've got a few vintage pens. That actually sounds like a bunch now that I'm saying it, but um, you know, it's not, I don't use them every day and I just kind of keep them in, I'm more just kind of have them just so I'm familiar with all these different, you know, kind of legendary, oh, I've got a Schaefer snorkel as well. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm kind of familiar with, with some of these pens. Um, but a good starter vintage fountain pen, I think most of the people I know that are more into vintage would say that Esther Brooks are a great place to start. Um, also Parker 51s or Parker 21s are, are iconic as well. Those are really good. They're, they're plentiful as far as vintage pens go. I think the Parker 51 is like the most uh, highly sold fountain pen in history or something like that. There's millions of them that were sold when they were in their heyday. So, um, and they're still pretty easy to find, especially at pen shows and stuff like that. Everybody's familiar with them. So those would be the best. The Esther Brooks, you can swap out the nibs and there's some cool things you can do with them. So that's probably where I would say to start. Beyond that, I can't really tell you what because that's where my knowledge like stops, right? Um, so let's see here, any tips for vintage newbies? Oh boy, I don't know. That's really not my area of expertise, um, you know. eBay is a great place, but you can also get burned when you're looking for vintage stuff. You know, pen shows are really good for that kind of thing actually, especially, I mean, I've only been to the DC show, but I know that's kind of the big one. There's just, it's just nasty with vintage pens. I mean, they're everywhere. And so, um, I really don't know. 
Anderson pens, Brian and Lisa Anderson, they're really into the vintage stuff. They're, you know, they're a competitor of mine, but you know, they, they got their own thing going. They're really cool. So um, they're really much more into the vintage stuff. So you can definitely check out, was it andersonpens.net, I think is their site. So go check their site out and see what kind of vintage stuff they got going on. You can shoot them an email and whatnot. They do, they're really big into the show circuit too. So they're really nice people. Um, they would have some really good advice. Um, and then you said, is there a vintage pen you'd bring back into production if you could? I mean, the Schaefer snorkel technology is really cool, but they're pretty complicated. And, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't want to, if I was a retailer, probably wouldn't want to be carrying them because from what I understand, the repair issues were pretty ridiculous back when they were in their heyday. Um, but I don't know. I would have to say the Parker 51. Just, it's a really cool pen. You know, the hooded nib is neat. It just writes really well. It's just such a good design. Um, that would probably have to be my, that would have to be my choice, I guess. All right, Alan V on Facebook. Did you see anything at the DC Pen Show that you don't carry and hadn't really thought about before that made you think, that would be really cool for us to carry? I'll be at the San Francisco Pen Show this weekend, but we'll carve out some time to watch Q&A. Thanks. Well, that's really cool, Alan, that you're, you're working me into your schedule there. That's neat. I hope you have a good time at the San Francisco show. I've never been there, um, but I heard it's a pretty good show, so I hope you like that. Um, you know, if you're asking me specifically about this most recent DC Pen show, I can talk about that, but, you know, if you're asking me ever if I've been to the DC show, well, that was the first DC show that I went to in 2009, that was where I had kind of my epiphany of like, oh, I should get into fountain pens. I need to learn about fountain pens. So you could argue that every product I carry in my store is a result of what I felt inspired from that DC show in 2009. Now, of course it wasn't everything I carry was at the show. It was just the birth. It was just the, the inkling, the twinkle in my eye of an idea about fountain pens that I got from that show. But you're probably asking more specifically about the show that I went to, was it? week and a half ago. Um, well, like three weeks ago at this point, by the time this is published. Sorry. Um, so yeah, anything that I don't carry. Um, there's a big vintage showing at DC. So there's not, there's not a lot of products that were there, new products that I don't already have my hands on or that I, I haven't already explored and decided not to carry. Um, I mean, there's plenty of cool stuff. There's a lot of uh, cool Delta pens and Montegrappa and Omos and stuff like that. You know, we've never really gotten into that stuff very much. Um, you know, I know the, the Kenro, the folks at, uh, with Omos have, have, you know, encouraged us to get more into their stuff a little bit. I haven't really like dove into Omos yet to figure it out. Their pens are more expensive, so I haven't, you know, it's it's not as like easy a decision to kind of pull the trigger and get into those. Um, but from what I understand, there's a pretty loyal following with some of the Omos crowd. So if, if you guys are really into Omos pens, let me know. It might help me to, to figure some things out. Um, but aside from that, you know, there's like some cool inkwells and pen cases and stuff like that, more like the vintage kind of stuff and like custom kind of things. Um, but yeah, that would probably be about it. I mean, most of it was, most of the reason we go to that show is just to get to meet people and say hi and see some people face to face that we don't see very often, if ever. So it was really pretty cool for that respect. So it wasn't so much of a trade show for us to go as it was a meet and greet. All right, Stephen K on Facebook. What do you think about carrying Conklin fountain pens? I bought a herringbone model with a 1911, or sorry, with a 1.1 nib at the DC show, and it's become one of my favorite pens. The feel, balance, and appearance are all top notch, and it writes beautifully too. Um, yeah, I actually have a herringbone. I got a couple different herringbones actually. I've got the older one that's larger and has like a gloss lacquer over top of it, and then I've got the newer one, which is probably what you have, that's a little smaller, lighter, and you can feel the pattern in that um, in that uh, metal, which is pretty cool. So you know, um, I can order Conklin. Conklin is sold through Yaffa. Um, Yaffa is the company that distributes Monteverde. So um, we do a lot with Monteverde, and we can get you anything Monteverde, Delta, Stipula, Conklin. Those are all through Yaffa. So we can get any of that stuff through special order. Um, we haven't stocked any Conklin because we haven't had a lot of people asking us about it. We've kind of been on the fence about it. We kind of got a lot of irons in the fire right now, so we haven't been drastically expanding like new offerings of stuff. Um, 
but it's certainly something that we could discuss. You can email info at gouletpens.com if you are interested in learning more about any kind of special, excuse me, special order. Um, the herringbone is nice. I do like I do like that pen. It's uh, it's kind of neat. I like the newer one better than the older one. The older one was really heavy, but the newer one is pretty cool. So that's definitely an option for you. Peter M on Facebook, do you guys sketch or doodle with fountain pens, or do you use other types of pens? Give me a second. Hmm. When I shoot two Q and A's in a day, I get very thirsty. Okay. We don't do a whole lot. I mean, we definitely are known, I don't know who you say you guys, I don't know who you're referring to exactly. I'm assuming you mean just kind of the whole team. I don't do a lot of doodling and sketching myself. I'm more of a writer. So uh, I take a lot of notes, you know, I keep notebooks here. I do, you know, when I do meetings and stuff, I'm usually taking notes, you know, with my pens there. So I don't, uh, I don't do a lot of doodling though. Um, but there's definitely some on our team that do, you know, Caitlin and Drew both like to doodle a lot. They doodle a lot whenever we get drawing requests on our, our um, customers' invoices. We'll, we'll uh, do little doodles on those if we're able to. Um, you know, we've got um, Joe who's been doing a lot of our Monday matchups and um, has done a lot of doodles and stuff. So that's, that's been really cool. Um, but, uh, you know, for personally, it's not really me. So um, you're asking what types of pens. Um, the favorites tend to be the flex nibs. So you've got the Ahab and the Conrad, the Falcon, you know, the Platinum Cool or the, um, you know, Platinum Machies, the nibs with a little bit of, of line variation to them. Those tend to be the most popular for a drawing. Gabriel F. on Facebook, I have carried my Noodler's Ahab daily now for over a year. How can I clean and polish the outside so that it looks new? It isn't treated rough by any means, but rides around in a pen case with others, and like I said, is a daily carry. Thanks. Well, Gabriel, it's, um, I totally know what you're talking about. Um, you carry those pens around for a little bit, and they will start to look pretty dull looking um, in terms of the finish, the matte finish, and they can get scratched. So there is a trade-off here with these pens between how shiny they will be and how scratch resistant they are, uh, and also how, um, crack resistant and how durable they will be. So when it comes to pens, there's always a trade-off between shiny and, um, yeah, basically shiny and not gonna scratch versus can scratch but won't break. So if you have a really brittle pen, it can be made to a high gloss. You know, I'm thinking like Platinum Preppy, right? So the Platinum Preppy, high gloss pen, but it can crack. You know, if you drop this thing too hard on the concrete or if you step on it when it's on the floor, you're probably gonna shatter this plastic. Versus a pen like your, was it the Ahab? You can step on that thing and it will not break. You can close it in a door and it will not break, pretty much, um, unless you do it just the right way. Um, that pen is pretty dang durable because the plastic has a little bit of give to it. It's not super brittle. The more brittle it is, the higher polish it can take. That's about the relationship. From a chemical standpoint, there's probably a better explanation that I could give for why that's all happening, but that's basically the trade-off there. So anyway, when you're dealing with a pen like the Ahab, you know, it's gonna have a little bit of fogginess to it. You're gonna be able to see all kinds of fine scratches on it, especially if you carry it for a while, and it's gonna look a little cloudy over time. You can polish this thing up. Um, there are a couple of things that I've used before. I don't know if I have any on hand to show. I've shown them in other Q and A's before, I know that. Um, people asking about polishing pens. Um, you can use a jeweler's cloth. A jeweler's cloth is just a, a soft cloth that has um, a polishing compound kind of in, built into it. So that can help. You can use micro mesh. You can use um, a really, really fine wet sandpaper, really fine. Um, that's kind of aggressive though. Um, you can use something like, a, like micro mesh mylar paper, something a really, really fine abrasive. Um, all those things will work well, or you can actually use like an, a polishing compound, like an acrylic polishing compound, or even an automotive polish. Honestly, you could use that, um, and that would clean it up. Um, however, realize that the plastic is still a little bit soft, and it's going to do the same thing again over time, but you can polish it up and have it look good for a while. Um, PJS on Facebook said, is there any way to prevent nib creep with Noodler's ink on a Lamy nib? I've had two different pens with two different inks and both keep creeping. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hear where you're coming from. Uh, I think 
the Lamy pens have a tendency to creep more and the Noodler's inks tend to creep more. So it's actually caused by both the pen and the ink. Um, when you've got a pen like the Lamy, for example, um, there's a couple of things that can cause creep. Part of it is the design of the nib, but um, um, other things that can cause it to creep is if you have very fine micro kind of scratches that are used from the, the cutting wheel when they make the cut for the slit of the nib. Um, if that cutting wheel leaves any kind of like side marker indentation or whatever in the side of that slit, that can be a channel uh, for the ink to travel up because it's all working by capillary action. So if there's any kind of inconsistency in the cut of that nib, then it can come up. And it's probably not even anything you would see, honestly. You would need a loop to really get in there to see if there was anything like that. Um, and if that happened, there's really not much you can do about it either. Um, it's just gonna happen. It doesn't really affect the flow of the ink in the pen. It's just gonna have a tendency to creep a little bit more. Um, but really, I think a lot of it too has to do with the ink, um, especially Noodler's ink um, is known for creeping. And in fact, that's why Noodler's called their first uh, pen that they ever came out with the Nib Creeper is because you know, Noodler's has kind of a reputation for creeping. And so he was kind of, Nathan was kind of poking fun at all of the people that turn their noses up at nib creep. So just a fun little fact there for you. But anyway, um, so yeah, the reason that the, those inks are tend to creep a little bit more is because um, the dye that's used to color the ink, uh, it's basically dye in water plus some biocides and lubricants and other things like that that are in the ink. Um, but the dye is very dry. It does not flow very well in a pen just on its own. The water is wetter, so the water flows better. Huh, water is wetter, water flows better. It's kind of a nice little rhyme there. Uh, anyway, uh, when you have a really, really saturated ink, like most Noodler's inks are, um, it would write dry normally, so more lubricant is added to increase the flow to counteract that dry writing dye. And the more lubricant is added, the lubricant has a tendency to make the ink flow more, even if it's up onto the nib. So that's why it's creeping more. It could be a combination of the two of those things, but that's a little background as to one, why possibly it could be happening more on some pens than others. All right, Pavel V on Facebook. <clears throat> Hi Brian, is it possible to fit a longer cartridge into a J or Bond rollerball? Or do you have some other tips to put some more ink in there? I mean more than a small cartridge. Thanks. Um, okay, so it's too short to fit a standard international long cartridge. I want to say I have one of these pens sitting around here somewhere. Um, I know last, a couple weeks ago when I shot, um, I did... Um, kind of a show my whole collection thing. And uh, that was kind of neat. So let me see if I have that pen around. Uh, and if I can't find it in like four seconds, I'll just give up. But I know that I have one of those Jerobon roller balls here somewhere. I just can't remember where I put it. If it's not in this roll, I'm gonna stop looking. Cause I'm sure there's, you have better things to do than sit here and watch me look through a pen roll. All right. It's gotta be one of these. Nope, 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 dang it. Okay, I can't find it, lost it. No, oh, here it is, okay, I thought it was in here. All right, so I've got the Jerobon Rollerball, right? Um, I'm looking at this thing and it uh, normally would be able to be convert to an eyedropper. It's got a lot of the right things going on. It doesn't have any metal components here. It's got a body cavity, it's even clear, but the problem is it's got these three little holes up here on the top of the pen. Now, if you wanted to plug these holes, then you could convert this thing to an eyedropper. That would be a solution. You'd have to throw a little bit of silicone grease on the threads here, maybe an O-ring if you've got one, um, and then you'd want to plug up these holes, probably using some sort of two-part epoxy would be the best thing. Um, I would say super glue, but that would get really messy and uh, epoxy would be a little bit easier to actually plug these holes up. So that would be one route that you could go. Is uh, It's a bit of a hack, but you could do an eyedropper conversion with it. Other than that, there's not much you can do because it's too short to fit a standard international long cartridge. Um, it's not long enough to fit a converter. And even still, a normal standard international converter is not gonna get you any more ink capacity than a short cartridge would. 
And uh, the only converter that'll fit in here anyway is the Monteverde Mini Converter, which has less ink capacity than your short cartridge. So that's pretty much gonna be your only option. All right. Elaine M on Facebook said, which pen would you recommend for a newbie? I like thin lines. Well, Elaine, I actually just did a video a couple of weeks ago called Top 5 Fountain Pens for Newbies. Uh, and so in that one, I gave my, my top five picks. I know some other people had some disagreements with the pens that I chose, which is okay because it was my opinion. Uh, but I would say if you, since you like thin lines, if I had to point to one pen, it's an easy decision, Pilot Metropolitan with a fine nib. It's 15 bucks, comes with a converter, it comes in a nice box. It's a solid pen, writes really well. The fine nib on that is very fine and it writes smoothly. You just can't go wrong with that pen. All right, Matei F on Facebook said, I love your Triumph paper, but how do I get it into a notebook? Um, we really can't because that Triumph paper is only available in tablet form. However, Clairefontaine makes both Clairefontaine and Rhodia paper. And if you are looking at the Rhodia web notebook, the paper that's used in that is fairly similar to the Clairefontaine Triumph, except that it's off-white instead of white. So that would be your best alternative. If you want to get a bound journal with, um, well, you didn't actually ask about a bound journal specifically, but if you want a bound journal with the paper that's closest to Clairefontaine Triumph, the web notebook would be it. Uh, if you're asking about just any other notebook, well then just any Clairefontaine notebook would do the job because the Clairefontaine notebook is going to be 90 gram paper. It's still very smooth. It's not quite as slick as Triumph. Triumph is the slickest paper that I can name. Uh, but the regular Clairefontaine paper is, is not too far cry off. All right, next question, George A on Facebook. How does one take the nib off a of Jin Hao 250? I know you don't carry them, but I would like to replace the nib with a Goulet nib, but have so far been unable to take it off. I have never seen a Jinhao 250 in person, so it's hard for me to say exactly, George. Um, it appears to be a different nib than what the Goulet nibs are, though. So I don't think that that is going to work. Even if you were able to pull it off, I'm, I'm not certain that that nib will fit on there. It looks to be a different, like, kind of thinner nib. So I, I would say that, um, not only do I not know how to pull it out, but I think even if you did pull it out, you wouldn't be able to swap that particular nib on it. Now, I don't know if there's another nib that could fit, perhaps, but I don't think the 250 swaps with that nib. Maybe somebody else who has a 250, if you've ever pulled the nib out of there, you can help George out in the comments. I don't know. But sorry, George, that's the best I got for you. Next question, Shardil T on Facebook. What is Brian's and Rachel's holy grail pens? Oh boy, so this is like such a definitive question, right? What is our holy grail pen? Um, you know, I used to have some holy grail pens back in the day and then I acquired them. And you know, after you acquire a holy grail pen or two, you learn that there's always a compromise. Nothing is perfect, right? It's either gonna be price, it's gonna be ink capacity. There'll be something with the nib that's not quite as ideal as maybe you had thought it up in your head. It's rare that you get anything that's truly as perfect as you expect it to be. Now, those who do find that, that's pretty awesome. And there are some people who their holy grail pen is a Pilot Metropolitan, and that's awesome because you have got you know, good standards there. <laughs> but um, for me and Rachel, it's a little tougher because we've handled so many different pens. For me to have something that's like so iconic, you know, it gets really tough to, to do that. Um, uh, woe is me, right? But um, Rachel, you know, I asked her about this and she said that she loves Nakaya pens. Um, she doesn't have any, but um, Nakaya is, you know, custom made pens, Japanese, gorgeous pens. I can't sell them. They're only sold through specific craftsmen that do it. Um, and so they have some very beautiful Machier pens. She loves Raiden pens and abalone shell, just anything with that sparkly kind of stuff in it, she really loves. So that's what she told me, some kind of Nakaya pen <laughs> was her grail pen. Um, for me, my <laughs> this might sound weird, but my grail pen is whatever the next one is that I'm looking to acquire. <laughs> 
uh, because otherwise why would I get it? You know, I don't have a shortage of pens. So if I want a pen, it's because it's the next pen that's like, oh yeah, I really want this pen. You know, I don't have some kind of ultimate grail pen because if I really did, I could sell off 10 of what I already have and go get that grail pen, even if it was a fairly expensive one. Um, but you know, I don't. I enjoy the pens that I have. I don't. I don't view it as I have to continue to aspire higher and higher. It's, you know, I really enjoy what I have, and I appreciate each pen, even if it's a pen that's not for me. I appreciate each pen for kind of what it is and what it has. There's very few pens that I really absolutely hate, but, um, yeah, I guess that would have to be my answer. Whatever the next one that I'm looking to get. All right, Kathy B on Facebook is actually going to take number. Question number 14 and 15 here. Number 14 is rather epic. It's technically not even a question, Kathy. So I debated about even putting this one in the Q&A, but the content was pretty solid, so I thought I'd go ahead and put it in here. So Kathy said, what I do, sketch and pencil and then ink lines, erase pencil lines, add watercolor. All right, so you're an artist, that's cool. Um, number one, a nib that will give varied line widths. Okay, so I'm assuming you're asking me for a nib that will give varied line widths. Otherwise, you're just telling me what you do. But making the assumption. So you want a nib that will give varied line widths. Well, Noodler's Ahab would be my first recommendation. Pilot Falcon. And pretty soon we'll be seeing um, the Pilot Custom 912 with the FA nib, which is supposedly more flexible than the Falcon nib. Now, I haven't used this nib before, so I don't know. But... I'm very eager to see it come into the US. I think it's coming December of 2014, is what I'm told. Um, otherwise, you gotta get them from Japan, pretty much. Um, so, that would be my recommendation. Noodler's Ahab or Conrad would, would be my first choice, especially high ink capacity, flexible nib, you know. You could also go the route of a stub nib or calligraphy nib. Um, generally, that's not as good for artists because um, that really restricts the way that you kind of hold the pen. I think artists tend to like flex nibs more than calligraphy nibs. Okay, number two, ink that dries fast, won't smear later when painting over it, is light fast, comes in a black black, and perhaps a sepia and dark blue. Okay, um, dries fast, won't smear. Okay, artists love the platinum pigmented inks. Carbon black, you just can't go wrong. Platinum carbon black, just, just get that, like don't even, don't even bother looking anywhere else. Get platinum carbon black. You're going to like that, especially because of the next question. But, you know, platinum carbon black. They also have a blue, pigmented blue. I don't know if I would call it a dark blue. It's not a light blue. It's kind of a medium blue. But you could always mix it with carbon black and get a darker blue if you really wanted to. Um, and then they have a pigmented sepia as well. Now, that sepia is not a true, like, yellow kind of golden sepia. It's more of a red sepia may or may not work for you, but it's another pigmented color. Pigmented ink works really well for what you're looking for here because it's gonna dry fairly quickly. It dries by sitting on top of the paper and drying on the surface as opposed to soaking into the paper and it's gonna be waterproof as well. So that's where it's really gonna be ideal. And you said, you know, painting over it light fast. I mean, there is nothing more light fast pretty much than these carbon inks because they have actual pigments in the ink. And pigment is way better light fastness than dye. And then the last question you had, paper thick enough for no bleed through from any media, handles erasing without damage to the paper, handles ink well, minimal feathering and dries fast, and of course works well with puddles of water for minimal buckling. Thank you, love your website, blog, and fabulous videos. Well, thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, so you, what you're asking for is like sketching paper, like hardcore watercolor paper, pretty much. Uh, I don't have a lot of that kind of stuff. Stillman and Burn, by far, is the way to go with that. They've got a couple of different thicknesses of paper. You can get um, 150 gram or 270 gram. The 270 is obviously going to be a little bit better for the buckling and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, from the people I know that do mixed media stuff, the Stillman and Burn is kind of the top choice that I'm aware. Um, I'm sure there's others out there because I'm not that plugged into the mixed media world, not really my scene. So um, of the artists that I know that kind of dabble in the ink washing world, they love Stillman and Burn, which is why I started carrying it, specifically like Jamie Grossman from Hudson Valley Sketches. Um, check out her blog. Um, she's kind of like the reason that I picked up Stillman and Burn. So um, 
that would be my recommendation there. And then the question that you had to kind of follow up, an art class requires India ink. What could I buy at Goulet Pens that would meet that requirement? That would be the Platinum Carbon Black. India ink is just black pigmented ink. True India ink is actually a calligraphy ink, and it's not intended for use in fountain pens. So you wouldn't want to use a true India ink. There's a couple of companies that make fountain pen India inks. I know Pelican is one that makes a fount India ink. Um, it's not as good for this application, actually, as the Platinum Carbon Black. So just get that. And that's it for this week's Q&A. So um, I hope you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Thank you for everybody that asked me these questions. Really good stuff. I'm glad to continue doing Q&A. Uh, as long as you keep showing up and asking me questions, I'll keep shooting them. That's kind of the deal. And I was trying to think, like, what question could I ask you as you go into your Labor Day weekend? Maybe something you could post into the comments. I don't really know. I thought about it briefly and then didn't actually think of a question. I guess, you know, what is your favorite... I don't know. Gosh, I'm trying to think. What did we just use an, as an icebreaker? We have a tradition at, at Goulet here. Whenever we have somebody new come on our team, at our next company meeting, we always ask an icebreaker of everybody, and it's something kind of neat to just kind of generate conversation and get to know each other a little bit better because we learn weird facts. We work together every day, but weird facts might come up. Um, and the one that we just did this past week with Madigan coming on board was, um, what was the first movie that you remember seeing in the theater um, as a kid or just in general? So what was the first memory that you have of a movie in the movie theater? And for me, that was the original Ninja Turtles movie. And I know it's funny because I got Ninja Turtles over here. I'm really not like that big of a Ninja Turtles buff. It's just something kind of funny because Drew is here. He's our customer care manager. We go back to the third grade. We both like played Ninja Turtles on the playground in elementary school and stuff. So, and now I have a son and he, he now wears Ninja Turtle clothes and stuff because he doesn't really watch it. He's a little young, but he's got, he's got friends of his that in preschool that have older brothers that watch it and that kind of thing. So now he knows all about the Ninja Turtles. So it's kind of just funny that he's now getting a little, you know, whatever. He's got, he's got friends and stuff that's weird. Before he was in preschool, we didn't really socialize much, but now he's got friends, so that's kind of cool. So anyway, Ninja Turtles was my first movie in the movie theater. I'd love to know what yours is. So if you're so inclined, just post in the comments. Tell me a little bit about the first movie that you remember seeing in the theater. So that's it. If you've got any questions for next week's q and I'll be back just doing another open forum. Um, they seem to be doing well. So um, you can leave a comment in YouTube, on Inc. Nouveau, on Twitter, on uh, where else? Facebook, you know, lots of different ways. Or you can email me gulayqa at gulaypens.com. I hope you have a wonderful weekend, long weekend for some of you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week and right on.